Emily Farrick, and I am the Digital Communications Coordinator as well as the Youth Ambassador Mentor here at KCI. So KCI's mission is to empower youth voices for climate action, and we have a very ambitious goal of reaching 10 million youth by 2025. You can learn more about KCI, our mission, and all of our goals over at our website at kportclimate.org. You can also explore KCI's programming, which falls under educating, activating, and empowering youth. And one of the most important ways that we do that is through our Youth Ambassador Program, which you'll learn more about at the end of the webinar. So as you can see on this graph here, climate change is youth's top concern. And that's why we're so excited to host this timely webinar on our changing winters due to the impacts of climate change. And as we transition into our presentation tonight, we just wanna to pause to appreciate that we've all come together to this webinar tonight from different perspectives, different backgrounds, and different ways of enjoying and participating in our winter season. We all have a stake in protecting our winters. So our ask to you is to please feel free to share in the chat box what your go-to winter activity is and why you guys love winter. And now I will hand it over to Ryan Breton, meteorologist at New Center, Maine. Thank you so much. Uh, great to be here. This is uh, an awesome group to be a part of. I'm really happy to be here and uh, kind of kicking off uh, the discussion with a little bit of the, the weather background into this whole story. I'm a meteorologist for New Center, Maine. We cover all of Maine and Northern New Hampshire, so it's a, a big geographic area. And in addition to forecasting, I actually get to do quite a bit of reporting on science, climate change, uh, the environment, uh, which makes my job pretty exciting. Uh, and I look forward to doing hopefully some reporting on what you all are doing to get involved too. Living in New England, um, the environment is really critical to our lifestyle, but also the industries here. Uh, we have a huge marine industry, not only in Maine, but through all of New England, uh, but also the ski industry crucial in the winter time. So it really affects everything. And even now uh, in, in the pandemic, just people trying to get out to dinner and get out to eat outside safely. The weather, obviously a huge part of that too. A big reason why the weather here is so important. Uh, Northern New England is, is really bounded by two major ecosystems, one being the Gulf of Maine, and then the other, the, the vast mountain regions to our west and north. And both environments are changing and they're kind of changing together. This is a, a look at the fastest warming season. And you can see that through the entire Eastern US, actually winter is the fastest warming. And on the right, you can see how each season is warming. And uh, winters are warming by about four degrees uh, since 1970, not only in Maine, but in a lot of Northern New England. If we go to the next slide, you'll be able to see really how that warming is happening. Uh, it's happening in a way that you may not notice. Of course, the really warm days stick out at you, like today, which, you know, even in a winter back in the 70s, a day like today would probably happen here or there. But last January, warmest January on record, we actually had a day where Boston got to around 70 degrees in the month of January. Maine was in the 60s. Um, but those are the days you think of and you think of climate change. Climate change is actually a little bit more subtle in the winter time. It happens to really show itself at night. Our overnight low temperatures are warming drastically. Uh, we've only had one night this season in Portland, Maine where the temperatures dip below zero. That used to happen a lot more frequently. So the average uh, winter temperature has gone up by about five degrees in Portland, but it's really the overnight lows that have changed. Why might that be? Well, the Gulf of Maine is a lot warmer and Portland, the Maine coastline surrounded by the Gulf of Maine. Um, and, and that really is like the control knob, the thermostat, especially with overnight low temperatures. If the ocean is a little bit warmer, you have a little bit of a breeze, not going to get as cold at night. So all of these things are kind of playing a role in warming temperatures, particularly in the wintertime. One interesting thing, if we can go to the next slide, is warmer air doesn't necessarily mean less snow yet, which I know seems strange, but there's actually an equation called the Cla clausius clapeyron equation. And I mention that because I know we have some college students on here. If you take a thermodynamics class, that, that equation 
may come up. Basically means a warmer atmosphere holds more moisture. Uh, if we can click again, that means storms can produce more precipitation. That's a trend you may have heard of. Storms are stronger nowadays. They're producing heavier precip. And that obviously means if it's cold enough when the storm is happening, it can actually mean bigger snow events to an extent. Um, obviously, if we keep warming and warming and warming, uh, the chances of that will become less and less. But even if we get big snowstorms, the next point is large swings in temperature after those storms mean the concern is keeping that snow on the ground to actually enjoy it. And one great example is from what happened in December. We had a massive snowstorm impact the Northeast. That whole red zone you see from North Central Pennsylvania into Central New Hampshire and Western Maine had two to three feet of snow. And a buddy of mine was at Okemo, Vermont. They had 40 inches of snow out of that storm on December 16th and 17th. Wild. But what happened on Christmas? It rained and all that snow went away. Uh, one more point I wanna make too, uh, storms are getting stronger and if you go to the next slide, that'd be great. Sea level rise is a huge concern. And obviously for County Bunkport as a community on the coast, that's probably the most visual way we see sea level rise. High tides are causing flooding more and more these days. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer, but that's a little bit of a, an overview of the climate changing here in Northern New England. Thanks. All right, so I'll kick it off now. Um, Bill Cobb here from Protect Our Winters, New England Local Alliance. Um, and a lot of you are probably familiar with POW. Um, if we can go on in here. So POW was founded in 2007 by pro snowboarder Jeremy Jones. You've seen a lot of his TGR movies. Uh, the super cool stuff that he does out on the slopes. But really, POW was um, intended to um, help passionate outdoors people protect the places and the lifestyles that they love from climate change. Uh, Jeremy speaks of this when, you know, he'd go out touring in the backcountry in the Sierra Nevada mountains, and a lot of the lines that he saw year after year were getting smaller or taking longer to fill in or disappearing quicker in the season. Um, and he's talked about, you know, instead of having first ascents like you'd see in, a, an, in traditional mountain climbing, there's now last descents where someone's going to have the last chance to ski a line before it evaporates entirely and that glacier is now gone. Um, so it's really shifted the way that we look at outdoor recreation and as uh, you know, outdoor recreationists and the things that we love to do. Um, so POW Together has brought together you know, more than 50 million people who recreate annually each year. And collectively, POW calls us the outdoor state. Um, and we're a huge force. You know, when we all combine together and start talking about the places that we love and the things that we love to do, people are going to listen when we have those kinds of numbers behind us. So Pal looks at the theory of change, and this is a pretty loaded slide, but uh, to quickly run through, you know, when we look at how we're going to make changes, it requires three main tiers. Uh, there's cultural changes that need to happen, there's political will that needs to be de uh, developed, and then there needs to be investment in um, technology and financial instruments. Um, but the key crux of Pal's theory of change is that these changes really happen at the margins. You know, we talk about as outdoor recreationalists how small margins and small decisions can make a huge difference. You know, if you look at an inch of snow that falls on top of Mount Washington, the wind's blowing the right way and that's gonna make for some great turns and right gully. Otherwise, the wind's blowing the other way and you're on boilerplate snow, gripping for dear life, wishing that something else had changed. So we look here in, in New England as a targeted geography where these thin margins can make a big difference. You know, the back in 2016, the Senate race in New Hampshire was decided by just over a thousand votes. That's an extremely thin margin that has major impacts for the national makeup of our Senate and what's going to be passed uh, for legislation to impact climate. So that uh, brought about the Local Alliance Program and where we are here today in New England. Uh, Powell recognized that there are these key geographies, New Hampshire and Maine being um, one of those, where we can have an outsized impact in, into creating political will, into embracing that cultural change and making those investments in technologies. Um, so we've developed here the local alliance um, on the ground. We're all volunteers and you know, we're open to anybody who would like to come and join us and learn more about the program and the campaigns that we're trying to do. 
And what we're doing is um, advocating for Protect Our Winter's mission, um, enacting their campaigns here, and engaging in local policy initiatives at the state and local level. And with that, I'd like to kick it over to um, Ellie, who is our uh, college and campus coordinator. She can share her story uh, with Pow and share some of the things that she's been doing in our local alliance. Thanks, Bill. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ellie. I'm uh, from Kittery Point, Maine, but I'm coming to you uh, today from uh, Colby College, where I'm a junior um, studying environmental policy and government. Um, and I've been with uh, volunteering with Protect Our Winters for just over a year now um, and started up with the local alliance last spring as we were kind of getting that up and running um, under Bill's fantastic leadership. Um, and like many of you, I am an avid skier. Um, in warmer months, I like to bike and sail and hike. Um, so love anything in the outdoors and definitely am concerned about um, the future of those activities. Um, and growing up in Southern Maine, I've definitely um, experienced the you know, increasingly unpredictable snow that we're receiving down there. Um, and uh, like Ryan was mentioning, you know, some of those days where high tides are creating flooding um, on the roads to get to my house. Um, and, you know, I've been, uh, you know, aware of these changes from a pretty early age and the decision to study these in college has definitely um, increased my passion in fighting for these issues. Um, so between that and my love for outdoor sports, I joined up with POW. Um, and as the college and campus outreach coordinator, um, I want to help spread this passion with other people and kind of encourage them to take action as well. Um, so I see this role as really two-sided. On the first hand, it's... Um, education is really important. So what we're doing tonight here and spreading awareness about these issues is um, the first step. And then second um, is encouraging young people to take action. And, um, you know, data shows that voter turnout among young people is historically very low. Um, so whether it's getting people out to the polls, whether it's getting them to testify at local um, town council meetings or just uh, writing or calling their representatives, um, these actions are really important for everyone, including um, young people to take. So I'm hoping that everyone uh, learns some stuff from this webinar and can take some actions um, following. Awesome, thanks Ellie. And uh, with that, we'll give a little preview. Um, coming up uh, just next week, we have the launch of our next big campaign. Um, this is gonna be a nationwide campaign, other local alliances um, and all of POW's Athlete Alliance. You'll see people like Tommy Caldwell, um, and Carolyn Gleick, pro skier out there, advertising their own challenges here. But uh, for us here in, in New England, we have a Crush Up for Climate Challenge. Um, we predicated ours based off of a study that was done by Alex Contasta of um, UNH. She found in a study um, that New England is losing, on average, um, two days of snow-covered ground every decade. And this has been going on for the last century. Uh, so we look back and over the last century, we've lost 20 days of winter. So to reclaim those days and you know, harness our energy again, we're challenging everyone to get active and get outside for 20 days in the month of March. Whether you're skiing, biking, climbing, hiking, walking your dog, whatever you do that's outdoors, get out there and do it for 20 days in March. Another component of this is taking that step to be politically active. Um, as Ellie said, you know, your generation especially is the future and so getting you involved and um, introducing yourself to our local representatives um, here in Congress and in the Senate, letting them know that this is something that you care about. Um, again, we have power in numbers, and if we can get hundreds and thousands of people calling up our senators and saying, we care about climate, we demand real actionable solutions, they're going to listen to that when, when they get that many calls over a short period of time. Uh, so this is launching off on Monday for March 1st, um, and we have a uh, kickoff party of our own. Um, on Wednesday the 3rd. Uh, I can drop the link into the chat for that if you want to sign up and, uh, and join us next Wednesday. All right, good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Blake Keough. Um, I am a POW athlete. I work with the POW New England, the local alliance. Um, I'm also an area instructor and ski guide uh, for Senate Mountain Guides over in Jackson, New Hampshire. Um, most of our work is spent on Mount Washington, uh, which tends to be pretty cold and windy, uh, sometimes snowy, <laughs> but usually just cold and very windy <laughs> and icy. Um, 
I, before working full-time as a guide, I was a psychology teacher at a local high school here in Portland. Um, so I really view the outdoors through the lens of both an athlete, but as well as one that's a little more academic in nature. Um, and I can try and tie those two things together. Um, early in my backcountry skiing career, I, um, I took actually two level ones before I thought I was ready to move on to a level two. And if you don't know what that is, basically there's a series of courses that help prepare you to move safely in the backcountry. Um, and after leaving my second level one, I, um, I triggered a rel relatively large avalanche in the Idaho backcountry. And what I realized is that all of the data, all the information that I was um, receiving or integrating really didn't have an emotional salience to it, right? It didn't have much meaning. Um, and it was soon thereafter that I realized that climate change essentially pro like proposes the exact same psychological problem, which is that we can have incredible professionals like Ryan telling us, giving all the data to us on a pretty much regular basis and for a long time now, that things are not looking great. And yet our behaviors don't really change or evolve in the way that we'd expect them to. Um, so really the parallel for me is that when we're moving an avalanche train, what we want is that data to be meaningful um, on an emotional level. And the problem that we face now with climate change is making that equally as meaningful um, for people in their own lives. And one of, I think, the greatest challenges that we face and that I'm really happy to see, um, you know, how really tackle, uh, especially this fall leading up to the election, was reaching out to folks who may not consider themselves to be environmentalists. And I really, really think this is one of the most important things we can do because the narrative of what it means to be an environmentalist uh, has been a bit narrow for a while. And we need to expand that aperture um, you know, so that it's including, I mean, a very simple example would be, you know, I'm very lucky to see the harbor, you know, Portland Harbor right here. All the fisher, you know, fishermen who go out day in, day out, especially those fishing for lobster, they actually have pretty good conservation practices if you look at the way that they manage lobsters on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't know how many of them would consider themselves conservationists, and yet they are a part of that conversation. And so that is um, one, of, one of the aspects that I guess um, why I enjoy working with Protect Our Winners um, and some of the future work that I hope to dive into. And then before moving on, I also just wanted to make note of the quote at um, the bottom of the picture here. Um, if you don't know Christine or Chris Tompkins, she was the former CEO of Patagonia, um, incredible environmentalist, um, but she is famous for, for this quote down here, which is, you can't protect a place unless you understand it and you can't love it until you know it. So I'm really glad to see Bill um, you know, asking people to get outside, whatever that means to you. The outdoor industry sometimes has a pretty, again, small, narrow window of what the outdoors means. Go for a walk, hang out in your park, throw a frisbee, whatever it might be. Um, but the more time we actually engage uh, in the out of doors, the more likely we are um, to actually protect it. So um, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop and whoever's up next. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> Thank you for that, Blake. Hi everybody, I'm Zoe. I am the sustainability coordinator here at Sugarloaf. I am the first full-time person to hold this position and it's the first time a full-time position has been offered at the mountain. Uh, that is due to our general manager who cares a great deal about seeing us succeed in this business and being leaders. Uh, part of that being our ability to tackle climate change at the mountain itself um, and to bring other folks on board with us. Um, part of that is the NSA Climate Challenge that we joined last year, which uh, tackles these four bullet points here. I don't need to list those off for you. Um, it's really just the principles that we are going to work within to tackle those badges that are on the right side there. Um, they tackle everything from technology to water, to forest health, to education, and so, it's my duty to make sure that we are working within those arenas um, to put our best foot forward. The addition that, that came this year was our signature to the We Are Still In Pledge, which represents over 2,300 businesses and many other departments, including churches and nonprofits. Um, really anybody can join, any type of business can join, but it's just a, it's a commitment to say that no matter what's happening in the government or in the larger grand scheme of things, we believe in the Paris Agreement and we're gonna act on that. So here we have the Forever Project, which is part of the Boyne Company um, initiative that we are now under. They purchased us two years ago 
And with their purchase, all resorts were signed on to a net carbon zero goal by 2030. Uh, net carbon zero means that any emissions you create associated with your resort are offset in some way or another. So at the moment, we have a two-year rec program where Boyne has generously purchased these energy credits on behalf of the resort. And after two years, we have to either figure out another plan or leave it up to the individual resorts to procure their own energy um, and identify energy efficiency opportunities here at the mountain. Um, there's a lot of things the mountain has already done that we should be really proud of. And I've listed those there under the past achievements. Um, some of these things have just been done by volunteers. Some are done by passionate individuals at the resort. And I think the four that I've listed there are some of the most recognizable. Um, you can see the new snow guns on the mountain. Um, you may not see the composting, but it's happening and that soil is actually going to the golf re resort um, in the summer times. You will see that there is no plastic or styrofoam at the mountain. Everything is compostable. Um, prior to COVID, it was actually all ceramic. And we have the Sugarloaf Express, which helps ship people from Char Farmington up to here uh, to help cut down on commuting miles. So we have a lot to do to get to that net carbon zero goal. Um, but this is just some of what we've done already that we're really proud of. And I'll pass it on to our youth panelist. Awesome. Zoe, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our speakers. I've never been on a webinar that is holding this tight to time. Um, in terms of five minutes, you guys just crushed it. So thank you so much. And I hope that everybody who's tuning in can be thinking about questions um, from everything that you just heard um, in terms of, you know, having or wanting to dive a little deeper with our panelists. So definitely leave any of those questions in the Q&A um, and we will be gathering those. Um, and also, also start thinking about your Crush It for Climate. I think that's such a cool campaign, uh, Bill and crew. So I know we will all hopefully um, be joining in that as of next week. So um, we are excited to pass the baton now to our youth panel. Um, they're going to kick it off. Actually, Jack will with introductions and then uh, start our, our round robin uh, of questions. Thank you, Megan, and thank you for those awesome intros from our panelists. Um, my name is Jack Reitz. I'm currently a junior studying business management and environmental studies at Springfield College. I'm actually here on campus right now. Um, I started working as a youth ambassador for KCI late last summer, and I've just been extremely grateful to be in a position where I can share my passion, um, both to my friends, my peers, but also to future generations um, who are interested in mitigating climate change. That being said, I was super excited to hear that KCI was collaborating with Protect Our Winters for this webinar. Um, I think myself and most of us can agree that there's never been a more imminent time to raise awareness for warming winters in New England. And I'm really excited to hear how myself and my friends and future generations can support. Um, so I've been a skier my whole life. I've been really lucky to have parents who are both skiers. Um, my dad's been on the slopes his entire life and between him his mother and my mother, I've been able to visit some incredible mountains. So I grew up skiing all over New England, primarily at Sunday River. Sorry, Zoe. Um, I worked as a ski instructor there during the winter of my sophomore year of high school. And I gained a ton of experience, a ton of patience, but also a ton of fear um, for the future of our winters in New England. The Sunday River usually boasts super uh, early season opening dates. But the mountain had been opening around Halloween in previous years, and I remember not being able to ski that year, 2016-17, until Christmas. So I'm very excited to hear what our winter experts have to say um, in terms of their responses to our questions. And with that, I will pass it off to my co-ambassador, Montana. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Hi, everyone. I'm Montana Stevens. I'm a junior at the University of New England. I, um, part, or I'm a youth ambassador with KCI because I'm actually interning with their sister, um, the Kennebunk Conservation Trust here um, for the spring semester. I am majoring in marine affairs and I hope to get a little more into environmental issues in general. Um, I unfortunately am not that avid in 
winter sports. However, I hope that um, with everyone talking about winter sports and the conditions of climate change and everything that hopefully like I'll be able to get out and try more winter sports as much as possible. <laughs> and with that, I'll hand it over to Sophie. <laughs> I am Sophie Farrick. I'm a sophomore at Kennebunk High School. I started working as a KCI ambassador this fall going into winter and um, I'm in the Gulf of Maine field studies class with Mrs. Lucci, which has taught me a lot of things um, and has uh, projected me towards uh, thinking about environmental career and um, so forth, but uh, I've been an avid skier for most of my life. Um, due to an injury two years ago, I had to stop until this year I started skiing again, so I hope to get back into that soon. So, yeah, and I guess we'll start with the round robin questions. Sure. I can go first if you like. Um, so I have a question for all of our panelists, if you don't mind, each given like a brief response in the order that you presented. So what was the most defining moment or experience that led you to work in the field of climate change? You want me to go first? Let's go, Ryan. Cool. All right. Kick us off. So my interest actually started just from weather. I'm a, I'm a meteorologist, but um, I think that when I was in college, I went to Penn State and graduated in 2016. Um, in the last 10 years, there's obviously been a huge, um, you know, revelation in the amount that we know about climate change. You know, there just is no doubt anymore. And actually, I'll be honest, and I'm never afraid to share this. Uh, 10 years ago, I was somewhat of a skeptic about climate change. And I, I'm happy to tell groups of people who are skeptical that because I'm proof that if you follow the science and, and, and listen to the people who do the research, that this is legit and it is a threat. Um, so I would say for me, it was while in college and, and taking the science and physics courses and learning about the dynamics of our atmosphere. Um, th there wasn't like one particular event uh, for me. It was more just a gradual kind of eye opening to what really is going on. And now living and working in New England, I'm originally from New Hampshire. Like many of you, I grew up skiing uh, and, and loving winters. And uh, we are a region of four seasons and we need to sustain that. Otherwise it will be a very different place um, if we don't. So I, I think that for me, it was more, I 10, 12 years ago, I wasn't so sure about climate change, but um, having learned about it, I'm now the one sharing with people that it's a, it's a legitimate threat. So I hope that kind of answers your question. Absolutely. Thank you, Ryan. Well, cool. yeah, I'll keep it rolling. Um, so, you know, for me as a, a volunteer with Protect Our Winters, um, I actually volunteered within an, another organization for a number of years before um, in adaptive sports and getting you know, people with uh, developmental or physical disabilities um, out on the slopes and getting them out skiing um, and working with you know, adaptive athletes. We talk a lot about accessibility um, and accessibility lessons when the conditions aren't great. To ski, it's it's tough to you know get ourselves out there as you know fully able-bodied people, and anybody who is dealing with a disability or a setback um, can have a harder time in, in more adverse conditions. So that transitioned well into you know focusing on how are we going to make um, outdoor activities more accessible, how are we going to make them more beneficial, and how can we promote health and inclusivity in the outdoors? Um, you look at some of the other initiatives that are going on through Granite Backcountry Association right now. Uh, with the Ski Kind program and making sure that, you know, the backcountry and backcountry skiing is uh, open and accessible and available to all people. That, I think, you know, there's a thin line that connects all those things together. And that's been a really driving force for me, wanting to be um, a good steward and a good advocate for our climate, for our outdoor places, um, and for the people who recreate in them. Um, yeah, I'll jump in here. Um, so I... 
have been very aware of environmental issues for most of my life. Um, but one moment that really sticks out to me that has definitely um, inspired me to continue doing this work is um, uh, the fall of 2019, there was a um, climate protest in Portland that I attended and just seeing the outpouring of youth um, presence there and the um, people that spoke, um, it was incredibly inspiring to see this gener our generation um, kind of take on this problem head on and, um, you know, not step down when it, things get challenging. Um, and it definitely inspired me to really be part of this push, um, you know, and the youth uh, our generation will, I think, make the difference. So um, really wanting to be a part of that um, and keep fighting. Um, yeah, I, I would say um, my involvement with, um, or even awareness of climate change um, was a slow progression. I um, I promise as a former teacher, I probably still get to the point, but like, I actually like, um, grew up not knowing that I had pretty profound ADHD, but the way to medicate, and I'm using that word intentionally, was to go outside into the out of doors. And I really mean that that was like, my brain went from like chaotic to all of a sudden everything, just the pieces of the puzzle just snapped together. And it was like, boom, life isn't like, it's all good. Um, and so I would get really upset when I would see things, um, you know, like I remember when we were little, like access to the um, you know, stream right down the street was all of a sudden like off limits because of new people who moved in or putting up new developments in places where we built forts and stuff like that. And so I took it really, I'm like, look, this is, these are the places I go to play and to feel better on a whole, on a variety of different levels. Um, so I would say just access to the out of doors was like my first like aha like, moment, I guess. And then layering on climate change, um, Honestly, it was a <laughs> it was a conversation. If you have ever opportunity, and this is going to be kind of I, we'll, we'll say in a Prius with the context of this conversation, um, but to drive across the country, it is a phenomenal learning experience. Um, and I I was driving across the country, um, and I was going through Eastern Washington. Which, if anybody's ever been there, you know that uh, as beautiful as it is, there's not a whole lot going on. <laughs> um, and I was listening to. Um, Barry Lopez uh, book on tape, uh, crossing or yeah, crossing open ground, and in uh, that series of stories, there's a moment where he's basically um, talking to a few children about you know, um, if I recall correctly, like a raccoon track or something like that. And somewhere in my mind, I imagine myself fast forwarding like 50 years and having to basically answer the question of like, so what were you doing when you watched all this unfold? Right, like, like, like to any of my students or a child that I might have, like, like it, you know, if you fast forward 30, 40 years and they ask me that question, so what is it exactly that you did in the face of this problem? And I didn't really have an answer at that time. I was like, well, <laughs> I guess I gotta do something because that's a pretty tough one, to, <laughs> pretty tough one to wrestle with. Um, so yeah, land access, driving across the country and listen to books on tape. Uh, I'll take it away. Um, I grew up at Pando, Pando Winter Sports Park, which had three tow ropes in Michigan and maybe a total vertical gain of like 150 feet. Uh, so really rinky dinky place that was super susceptible to anything to do with cost increases. And ultimately when the weather started changing and becoming more sporadic and it turned to rain instead of snow in December and seasons were shortened, um, snow making one was, was one of those costs that became a lot higher. And maybe five years later when I was about, I think 17 or 18, the resort actually closed. And it was really sad to see this resort close. It was actually one of the, it was the first place where Jake Burton took a snowboard down a hill at a competitive competition. And um, Michigan has a rich history with snowboarding. So to see that diminish a little bit was really sad. And then I'm gonna echo what Blake said about public lands because I lived in Utah for a while and seeing how easily those can be exploited, I definitely got very concerned um, and wanted to make sure that we're protecting all parts of our environment and not just the winters. Thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you all. I will pass the next question on to Montana. Jack, and thank you all you panelists for sharing your growing experience, um, uh, experiencing climate change. Um, 
So I have two questions for Ryan. The first one is from the recent unusual cold spells and snow in Texas and southern parts of our country. Do you think that odd or extreme weather events like this will become a more regular occurrence if climate change is not addressed more urgently? Sure. So I think uh, th that's actually kind of a difficult question to answer because there's still research ongoing about that type of a, a weather event. Um, there is some indication that when the Arctic warms, so when the air up over the Arctic warms, the polar vortex, which is kind of like the control uh, region of cold air, tends to weaken. And when that weakens, pieces of it come south. And there's, there's some preliminary research that in a warmer world that can happen more often because up in the Arctic, it won't be as cold. Um, so as for an event like we saw in Texas, it's still very much under um, research at this point because that's such an, an unusual type of an event. But to your broader question about are weather extremes becoming more uh, uh, more frequent? Absolutely. Um, perhaps one of the most significant ones are extreme precipitation events. And as I mentioned before, not just rain, but also snow events. Um, storms are able to hold more moisture. Um, think of Hurricane Harvey, actually, which hit Texas a couple of summers ago. It dropped like 40 inches of rain on the city of Houston. So they've had a, a crazy... Um, ride of, of extreme weather lately. Uh, so the specific event that happened a couple of weeks ago with snow and cold, we can't directly tie to climate change, but we can say that extreme events um, are becoming more frequent, particularly with precipitation, um, heavy rain, and even in some cases, uh, extreme snow events too. Hope that's helpful. Yes, is it? thank you. And then my second question is, how has your job changed as the climate crisis worsens? Uh, my job, actually, I view myself as not just a weather forecaster anymore. I'm a station scientist. Uh, so I don't just get on TV and talk about the weather. I get to share science with our viewers. And there is a growing um, portion of our audience that's interested in that. So whether it's discussing climate change or something more specific like sea level rise or environmental regulations. Um, those are all things that I am allowed and encouraged to do uh, by my management here. Uh, some people are not uh, at stations or in environments where that's as welcome, uh, but fortunately our news management here encourages it, welcomes it. So I view myself as kind of a climate reporter in addition to just talking to people about the weather. And I hope to, whenever I get provide a story or share a story, I don't try to take a, uh, a stance that could show a political leaning one way or the other. It's just, these are the facts. This is the science. Um, and hopefully that by taking that approach, I can reach people who are otherwise turned off by politics these days. So that's kind of how I view my role as evolving through this too. That's awesome. Um, I will hand it back to Jack now. Thank you, Ryan and Montana. Um, so I had a few questions for Bill and or Ellie about the New England Alliance. Um, so what would it take to join the New England Alliance? And are you looking for participants of a specific age or with experience in the field of earth studies? Yeah, uh, great question. So, um, you know, as, as I had mentioned about like inclusivity and accessibility, um, you know, climate doesn't really care who you are, how old you are, what you do, it's gonna have an impact on you. And, and so we're, we're open to anybody um, and, and anyone of any age group, of any background. You know, I think a lot of people look and say, oh, how, how can I get involved with climate? I don't have a degree in environmental science or I'm not an, an engineer or an electrician or someone in the power field. Um, I graduated with an English degree. I, I now work in tech consulting um, as, as my, my day job. Um, but this as a volunteer position is something that I can be very involved in and, and very passionate about. Um, so we're open to anybody who wants to uh, become a member of our local alliance. Um, and Ellie can uh, talk a little bit about what you know she's doing specifically with colleges. But yeah, we'd, we'd welcome 
anyone who does want to get involved, um, you know, college too and in high school, you know, from a political perspective, if you're in high school right now, you might not be of age to vote, but in a few short years, you're going to be, and you still have influence. If you called up your legislators and your, your, your local representatives and stated that you care about um, this particular issue or this particular plan or a bill that's going on, your legislators will listen to you. Um, and especially if we get the numbers behind it and you get your friends and your family to get out there and call about it, you know, just because you can't vote yourself, your opinions and your concerns still matter. Yeah, I'll just add on a little bit to what Bill was saying. Um, so um, a big goal is to kind of create a network of individuals at, on college campuses or at different high schools um, or just youth um, in general. And so that when Protect Our Winters um, and specifically the local alliance identifies something that we want to act on um, and encourage people to um, voice their opinion on, uh, we have this network to then, you know, spread that message and, and encourage people to act. So um, if you are someone on a college campus and are interested in getting more involved, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and that way, you know, we can start forming these contacts across New England at these different schools. You can build um, groups at your schools to, um, you know, carry on this effort. Um, so if we identify a policy in your area, then you can reach out to your legislators or, you um, take appropriate action. That's perfect. My follow-up question was what would a role of a current college student like myself be with NEA? So you answered that. Thank you both very much. And yeah, I did um, just drop into the chat um, a sign-up page for the Local Alliance. So you can sign up to join uh, directly on our page. Um, and I have a registration link as well for our kickoff party. I'll add in there too. Perfect, thank you. I believe Sophie is up next. All right, thank you, Jack, Bill, and Ellie. This question is for Blake. So in the work that you've done in the winter industry and climate change, but also your background in psychology and teaching, what advice do you give youth about staying positive and holding on to hope as we deal with these issues due to climate change? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> um, well, think through um, the lens of psychology. Uh, there was, there was, or is an ongoing phenomenon um, that I think is really interesting and 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 offers um, for all of us some hope. So, if we look at the last three million years, the greatest amount of climate um, fluctuation. Um, was within the last million years or so, plus or minus. We're just going to push those numbers a little bit. And then at the same time, a co-occurring event um, is that our brains actually rapidly grow in size. And so do our social networks. And social networks, not like the ones we understand today, we're talking like we go from 10 or 12 to like 100 to 150 people. That's a lot. Um, so our social networks grow, our brains grow, and particularly an area of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. And we don't necessarily have to like dive into the details of, you know, different parts and functions of the brain. But what I find very hopeful about that is that while human-caused climate change is a bit of an anomaly, especially the rate at which it's occurring, human beings have faced incredibly harsh climate conditions before. And we have in short, risen to the occasion because we have used each other, we have relied on each other as a social species to make, make our way through this, right? And so I wouldn't pretend to say that this is the exact same as other climate fluctuations, um, but there are indications in the past that we have found a way through. And I would say the same in a much more subjective sample size of one is true of my work at, you know, in the mountains. Um, they are, especially my work is pretty much focused on, in, in, you know, winter exploration. Um, I don't have the joy yet of, of, you know, hanging out on warm, dry rock in the summer and guiding people up and down mountains. Um, you know, so what I've seen there is that, um, you know, human beings are incredibly resilient, incredibly resilient, even in the face of um, variables and factors that seem completely overwhelming, uh, we continue to find a way, a way through. And it's sometimes it's ugly, it's messy, it doesn't feel great in the moment, um, but one way or another, one foot goes in front of the other and we find a solution. 
Um, and that has been pretty consistent both at an individual level and a collective. Um, uh, it's one of the hallmarks of our species. Yeah, hey, Blake, uh, I don't, I don't want to jump in totally here, but one thing that I've always pointed out, uh, I do some school visits and I've received that question before from students and teachers. One thing to be aware of is that because of science, we, we know about all of these things. And I know that it seems like a, a monumental uh, challenge that we all are facing. But uh, even though we are in this difficult political climate, um, science hopefully will lead the way in the end, one way or the other. And uh, the fact that, that, that we have people who are passionate about this issue and, and youth that are so passionate too, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic too, even though I know that in the moment it can feel really, really challenging and, and like a task that we can't, uh, you know, overcome. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I get the same question a lot too. Thank you, Blake and Ryan. And I'll hold, uh, hand the next question over to Jack. Thank you. So I have a few questions for Zoe um, about the future of the ski industry in New England. Um, this is actually, I'll quote a Protect Our Winters study by Dr. Elizabeth Burkowski and Rebecca Hill. Uh, they were prof professors at the University of New Hampshire and University of Colorado. Um, study, they both studied the economic impact of climate change on the winter ski and sport industry. Um, they did a study in 2018, um, which reported that the winter ski and sports industry accounted for 191,000 jobs across the country and generated $6.9 billion in wages. This also contributed to $11.3 billion um, to the nation's economy in 2016. Nationally, the lowest annual snowfall years reported between 2001 and 2016 resulted in 17,400 fewer jobs per year in the winter sports industry. So my question to you as Sugarloaf Sustainability Coordinator and leader of action plans like the Forever Plan, uh, do you think these weather patterns suggest that more mountains will be investing in sustainability departments like Sugarloaf has? Yeah, absolutely they do. Um, I'm glad I got this question ahead of time too, because I was able to look at the NSA climate challenge and see who the participants were and what those numbers have looked like over the years. Um, and every year that you have to report um, on your carbon footprint and how you're acting on that. And in 2013, there were 14 resorts that actively reported. Uh, 2018, there were 23 resorts. So seeing those the increases happen um, in just five years is encouraging. And I think it is scalable, like working with that um, NSA climate challenge, it's complex and it requires a lot of time. So I don't think you need to have an individual person like myself to make sure that these actions are happening at any resort. I think just having uh, passionate employees and then managers who allow them the time to maybe explore different options or ideas is really valuable. Uh, what I think of when I conjure up some examples is my boss. Um, my position existed because my boss asked the general manager, how are we acting on sustainability? And then he goes, well, I don't know how, but you can. And so he had that opportunity to find someone. Um, and that's how that happened to be me. Um, but on a smaller level, there was an employee who was interested in composting and she was a volunteer and she's been doing it now for almost 20 years here at the mountain. And so I think just allowing small projects to take off if you don't have those resources for really big projects is also important. And we do see that um, happening at many resorts more so than I believe in the past. Thank you very much. Um, and then to follow up, how could um, people like myself, mountain goers like myself and all of us who aren't actually in the physical department, how can we help support our favorite mountains uh, reach their sustainability, sustainability goals? Yeah, so there's a lot going on behind the scenes that probably isn't so obvious to all the skiers that are coming there. Um, and that's why I think we just need compliance and enthusiasm from the skiers. So when you see a recycling bin, um, making sure that it is clean recycling that you're putting in it, or when you're at your condo, that you are taking your bottles and cans to the um, redemption center and whatnot. Because if we want to enact these different types of programs, we have to make sure that they're going to work and to get them to work we need our thousands of 
um, supporters on board as well. So having everyone on board for any types of those initiatives is going to be really important to making sure that they stick around. And we always do invite you to do the individual actions, um, like having reusable water bottles or carpooling or um, not throwing your trash off the chairlift and things like that. Uh, but I do really want to emphasize that the biggest impacts are going to come from the ski resort uh, tackling our footprint, and we just need the support of everyone else to do that. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll let Sophie finish it off. All right, so the last question is for KCI. Um, and besides advocacy on social media, what can youth do to stay involved and make change in this issue? Awesome, thanks Sophie. And thanks everybody for your questions. Um, I've been presenting, so I haven't been able to see any of the questions that were uh, put into the chat. So I know that we're gonna be excited to, to dig into those. Um, but to just finish things up tonight and really conclude, um, Sophie, your question is perfect. So it's, it's resources, it's figuring out how we go beyond kind of conversation and take next steps. And uh, the Protect Our Winters team shared some awesome examples. Um, and the work that we do here at the Kenny Bunkport Climate Initiative is completely focused on educating, empowering, and activating youth for climate action. Um, so while I say youth here, that also often includes adult allies and mentors. Um, so I hope everybody who's still here with us um, can take something away from this. Um, so educate, just to share quickly. Um, we, so we have an incredible director of programs, Leah Lowry, um, and we'll be sharing her information with all of you on the call. Um, but essentially, we were able to take our, um, our key programming and the reason that KCI even exists. Um, and because of COVID, we digitized it. So we have an online resource called Learning Lab. Um, and there's also a student lab. And those are going to really dive into um, some of the issues that we're dealing with our changing climate and uh, really start to think about how you can put um, action to those issues. So definitely check out the Learning Lab. Um, urge uh, your educators to take a look as well because there are full free curriculums um, to be uh, utilized that we're super excited about. Uh, we also have a whole section of our website called KCI Causes um, and those are aligned um, you know just with action areas um, and that includes energy, what's going on with our oceans, equity, um, our footprint, uh, invasive species, and weather. So definitely take some time to, to poke through those. So let's move from education of the issues into empowerment. So that's becoming a, youth, uh, a KCI youth ambassador or an adult ally. We're gonna share some links. Um, I know that Bill already shared links about joining the Protect Our Winters New England Local Alliance. I hope that we all will be a part of that after tonight's call. Um, and then there's something super cool. Um, so Leah has put together something called a community mapping workshop. Um, and this is a resource on our website as well that walks anyone from any town through really being able to sit down, kind of a youth led conversation, but also with stakeholders in your community let's just look at our town. What are the areas that um, could be affected negatively by climate, climate change impacts? What are those? And what are the conversations we need to start happening um, you know, to start to look towards mitigation? And we've seen this work um, and your youth voices have already created um, incredible change. Um, so that's one thing. And then you'll see a picture uh, with the degrees there. Um, but one of our advisors, uh, Dr. John Sturman from MIT, actually created this incredible free um, climate simulation tool online called En-ROADS. Um, and so this simulation tool uh, essentially gives everyone the chance to design their own scenarios to limit future global warming. Um, and I really encourage everybody on this call to go check that out. So uh, Emily will be putting the link in, um, but it's just really important to start to think about all the different facets that need to be talked about and worked towards um, as our communities, our states, and our nation to be able and 
globally uh, to make real change. So definitely check out those resources. Um, and then all of this leads into activation. So holding local town halls um, and starting climate action projects in your backyard. Those are all things um, that we have some prompts um, that are freely available and we would love to share with you. So again, we will be sending out uh, a recording of this webinar as well as some helpful links and some extra answers from our amazing panelists uh, who so generously gave their time tonight, as did all of you. So thank you so much. Um, it is 8 p.m. on the dot, everybody. So uh, just again, thank you for your time. And we hope that this is only the start of this conversation. So thanks, everybody. Thank